Hey everyone, my name is Erin Ross and this is my Artist Spotlight, where it is my mission to connect you with amazing artists all over Instagram so that you can learn from their experiences and discover the secrets to their success. In my ninth episode, I will be interviewing Luis Yepes, who was born in Mexico City and is the first artist that I'm interviewing that I didn't find on Instagram. I actually found him on LinkedIn. Luis is a 3D environment artist and level designer who's been working in the gaming industry for over 15 years. His current role is at Meta, creating worlds for Horizon in VR. To hear about how he got into the industry and what it's like working in VR, keep watching. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm good. Is it just Aaron? Um, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Aaron. And okay. Luis. Right, yeah. okay, cool. And then you're in Bellevue too, right? Uh, I am. You're in Bellevue? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm yeah. In, in Bellevue, Washington. Whereabouts? I'm downtown. Oh, same. Oh, cool. That's funny. How long have you been in Bellevue? Uh, Bellevue, I, I've lost track like years and years, but Washington, which the general vicinity, I've never really lived anywhere too far out um, Yeah. since 2005. So. Oh, okay. So That's quite a bit, <laughs> quite yeah. a bit of time. Do you work remote then? I do. Okay, that's cool. I, yeah, I've been working remote for two years now. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, okay, since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, pretty much. Me and my partner both work remote too, so it's pretty cool. It's nice having those, those hours to yourself. Yeah, it gets, um, I, I don't know what your place is like. Our, our, my place is kind of small, so it does. it's starting to get to us, uh, to me and my wife. Like, it, yeah, so I, I'm actually in my bedroom. Like, that's the best spot that I was able to find to have, like, privacy while I was like working and stuff, which is not ideal. I don't like okay. waking up and seeing the computer on the, on the corner. So yeah. Okay. I can relate because my office right now, we're in a one bedroom apartment. So my office, like there's the hallway with the door right there. And I'm like right next, like, here's the couch. No. The room. <laughs> I'm behind the corner behind the couch. Yeah. We have like a, a one-year-old that is going to, he's going to be one year in a week. So I was actually in his room, which was our office. Oh, until okay. he was born and then and he stole. I got kicked out um <laughs> and then I was in the living room and that was fine while I was uh in my last studio but now yeah. that I'm over in uh Facebook it was like I needed a little bit more privacy and stuff and the kid yeah. is growing they need more space so it made sense for me to get into the bedroom versus and yeah. leave the my house to, to to my wife and my son avoid the ruckus <laughs> yeah I can imagine everybody working from home with um with kids I I feel for you guys <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been too bad my wife takes the brunt of it during, okay, during the day so <laughs> does she work from home too uh she's full full uh stay-at-home mom right now yeah she used oh, to cool. she, she's a fashion designer and like interior designer oh, so awesome. she used to do like displays and stuff for macy's and things like that but yeah she's been she got furloughed early on in the pandemic and then got pregnant and so on so like she just hasn't really been back to to doing that since that makes sense. I've never, <laughs> I've never met anybody in fashion before. That's cool. So where did you move to Washington from? So I moved from Phoenix. I was, uh, I studied in, I was studying uh, art in uh, the Art Institute of Phoenix, mm. but I'm originally from, I was born in Mexico City and I grew up as a teenager in uh, Cancun. So I technically moved from Cancun to Phoenix, Yeah. But I moved from Phoenix up here. So I've never been to Cancun. Is it nice? <laughs> Uh, it, it is. I haven't been there in years. Uh, oh, okay. I, I think it like it's changed quite a bit, but it, it's super beautiful. So yeah, yeah. I'd love to go one day, but sometime in the future <laughs> when all the pandemic madness is over. Yeah, same. We want to go back and visit family, so we haven't been able to. How would you describe your art journey? So my art journey is interesting. I think, I, I, for one, it's ongoing, but more than an art journey the way i see it it's like it's it's my develop it's my journey in my career more than art it just happens to be filled with a lot of art in its path i started as a environment artist in the game industry well actually i started doing film uh animation a lot of like just 3d in general that's how i, I got into the into the game industry but compared to a lot of other artists that i'm sure you've talked to and, and stuff i actually tend to find myself more in the design realm so I end up thinking a lot about function and uh, experience and things like that, which are things that are very important to, to art, but 
ultimately yeah. like I focus more on like users at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm a little bit more focused on, on that end. Okay. Well, yeah, that's kind of a cool position to be in because like you're kind of using your left and right brain. Yeah. I've always drawn, I, I like, I've, since I was little, I always like been creative. So I was always drawing and, you know, coming up with things, but I've also been attracted to the technical side of things. Like I was really good in math uh, when I was mm-hmm. in high school and uh, going into college and things like that. I was actually going to, I was already enrolled to go into programming. That's what I was going to study. Oh. Uh, I was like literally about to start programming. And then I found that I could actually learn how to do art for video games. And I made a, like a last second, like U-turn um, oh, into that. So it's that those two parts of my brain have always been kind of like going back and forth with yeah. each other. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. What made you decide to make that switch? I don't, it, it was just the way that I knew for sure I could get into games. Um, like since I was little, I wanted, uh, I think it's also like seven years old or something. I remember uh, I could tell my mom, I want to make video games uh, oh, when, okay. I, when I grow up. So that's that was always the thing. But growing up in Mexico, there was like very, at least at the time, there was so little resources in terms of like programming or, you know, an actual career for art other than graphic design. And that was, wasn't something that I was like super interested in. Um, yeah. And I didn't really know what you needed to le- learn to make video games. So yeah. the best that I could put together was like, if I could learn how to program or do some kind of computer science that maybe put, puts me on the path. Yeah. Uh, and so I went into with that direction of like, that's what I'm going to study. And then last minute I found like a tiny little article in a magazine that was like, oh, you can study to make art for video games. And I looked into it and it was all like, you know, 3D and focused specifically for games. But after going through it, looking back, it's just like a generic uh, 3D yeah, course at the yeah. Art Institute. They teach you a couple things, but I mean, you're talking about early, late, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, you know, so <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of how I got into, into that path. Cool. Yeah. I'm surprised you, you know, were that young and thinking about, you know, video games as a career. Cause like when I was that young, like I knew I loved animated movies and art and movies and video games were really cool, but I like never made that connection in my brain that like somebody actually did that as a job. So that's pretty cool that you like, I don't know if that. I made the connection. Oh. I, think I, just, I think I just claimed that I'm like, I want to do that. I, I had no idea you needed to make money. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is cool. So I want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. I noticed on your LinkedIn that you have, obviously you have your, you know, you went to college and got a degree and there's like several certificates, like certifications that you have as well. Mm-hmm. And then obviously there's like the learning you do, you know, just on your own, on the job and stuff. Where do you think your most valuable education has come from? Like where have you gained the most knowledge? So I think a little bit of all the above kind of thing. Um, one thing I will say, you you get you usually hear, especially nowadays with YouTube and how much information is out there that you can just like learn so much on your own. There's yeah. so many comments about like school's not worth it. Um, you know, don't waste your money. There's some truth to that nowadays uh, compared to like you know 15 years ago. But I learned a lot by going to school because it put me into like a dedicated time where I was like learning that I was focused on doing that. I wasn't like sidetracked with anything else. I also met, you know, some of the coolest people that I like to this day uh, know, and they've all gone to work on like amazing things like Halo and, you know, really like large projects and large companies. So I made a really good uh, core group of friends there. So I, I think that's where a lot of the foundation on, especially understanding 3D, because I did not know how to do any 3D uh, when I started at all. I knew how to draw and then draw like I can draw, but I can't really like sell my drawings or anything like that. Um <laughs> I can draw enough to communicate an idea, but like not something that somebody's going to look at it and be like, oh, I want realism. (laughs) Yeah. um, So that, and then I think like my first job um, in, in the, in the game industry was the one where I learned the most because I got thrown into the thick of it immediately. And I, when I was, uh, when I was starting, I I was naive thinking that you were going to get some kind of like mentorship as you were going. Mm -hmm. And there was none of that. It was like, I was the, the only environment artist on the team. Um, <laughs> no game experience. Help. Yeah, no game experience previous to that. And we were like gating, we were like just at the edge of um, green lighting the, that project in particular. So like I had to start making levels and full environments and things like that by myself. You know, and there was a 
one of the other artists that was a, a lead, he was in a environment, he was like vehicles and other things, but he had a lot of experience in environments. Uh, Dan Valley, he really like kind of took me under his wing and mentored me and stuff, but he didn't like sit there and show me how to do stuff. He just yeah. kind of guided me. So like, I learned a lot from, from him. Oh, that's good. I can imagine that's like terrifying when you, you're just like thrust into a, like a job where you, you know, you have a lot of learning to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, looking back on it now, it's like, it's no different than any other thing. Even when you've done it a million times now, like if you, it's the same, you don't really know, even though you've done it already. Uh, it's mm-hmm. always new. There's always a new challenge. There's always a new, new tech, new something that like throws you off. So yeah, uh, I, I it wasn't that kinda... scary. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> I guess it's just like, getting used to the fact that you always have to be ready for different things and learning new things and adjusting as you go. That's probably something people in this line of work should, you know, be aware of. Uh, Yeah. I mean, just going back a little bit to the school part of it, I think school prepared me for that because going going to school, I I was, um, I don't consider the Art Institute like a traditional college. It's it's more like a vocational school, right? And I was under the impression from knowing going to college that there was going to be all these teachers and they were going to like really mentor you and kind of break you and make you like bring up your skill set. There was none of that. Um, There was none of that. There was only like, I think two teachers there that like were actually working in the industry and this was Phoenix. So there wasn't a huge game industry at the time over there. I think there's more little indie game uh, studios now. There was like maybe two teachers that were studying. So everybody else had either just knew the software or had some kind of like relationship to it so they could could teach you but um we had to like learn on our own and so there was a lot of group of of people that were just goofing around playing smash brothers or something else right and like waiting for like when are we going to get the new max like waiting for that kind of stuff and there was the other group of folks uh that i was a part of where it was like eight of us or something we're constantly just in the labs working learning like how do you mod how do you do this how do you do that and so school prepared me honestly for getting thrown into that kind of environment oh well that's awesome sound like you went into school with a great mindset a lot of people go in and you know expect that like you said like the teacher is going to do it all for them and you know make sure that they learn it um Mm -hmm. but it's it's really um self-directed in a lot of ways it, it is and I you don't really know that when you're jumping in you think it's going to be different so so what was your first game design job out of school my first game design job was working on the age the agency I don't know if you ever heard of it it was a MMO for PS3 it was the first it was one of the first of its kind um back then when you heard MMO it was always PC not action or it was all fantasy and stuff. So this was like spy action, kind of 007. Um, And it had the added, uh, I I think we were supporting, it was like first person and third person support at the time, which was completely unheard of at the time. So it was a really ambitious project. That was the first like game design uh, project that I I, uh, had experience with. And so it wasn't anything little or, you know, subtle. It was like, one of the biggest projects you could ju- get dumped on and one of the most ambitious ones. So that, that was my first uh, one. I had experience with more um, modding Unreal, doing levels like that for Unreal Tournament, but not a, not a, like a proper game project going. Gotcha. And I'm assuming the school that you went to, they didn't like help you get jobs afterward because I don't think most places are like that. They, they say they do, but like, no. Nah. <laughs> I actually remember I, I graduated and uh, because I'm from Cancun, Mexico, like I was under a, a student visa. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is nowadays, but when you graduated, you had like a six month grace period where you could uh, be looking for work and you could try to get work and get sponsored. And so you could remain in the, in, in the country. Yeah. But, so you couldn't go and like work, say, for McDonald's or something. Like it had to be in the field. Oh, um, OK. So yeah. the. The Art Institute considered, I think, like three months afterwards, they would reach out to you and be like, if, if you got a job, they would kind of try to coach you a little bit on interview, on, on interview questions, things like that. But that's about it. And if you didn't get a job within those three months, they wouldn't consider you a success story. Um, so I remember I got my, my job like just shy of the six months because I had multiple times where I was about to get the offer. But because of this visa sponsorship, studios would uh, back out. Yeah, I reached out to my counselor at the time and I was like, hey, I got a job, blah, blah, blah. I'm moving over to uh, Washington. 
do you want me to fill out any of these survey things that you you've been sending to other folks? Uh, it's like, oh no, we don't need to do that because you're out of the time period. You're not considered a success story. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> How did you get the first job that you did get um, close to that six months? So I had to. It was really, it, it was really hard. I went through six months of nonstop working. It was like crunch time uh, working on my portfolio and stuff. The core group of people that uh, we were all learning together, we uh, also lived together. Uh, we ended up like moving together and all of them got jobs at, I think it was Rainbow Studios in Phoenix. And I was part of that group that was going to get a job with them. But because of the visa stuff, like I got like passed, passed on. Um, but while they went to work, I would just stay at home and I was like working on my portfolio. I had to like dump everything I had done in school. I had to like erase everything. Like I had nothing. I think that was like one of the biggest lessons I learned trying to get into breaking into the industry was like, don't think that what you've made in school is going to get you in. Um, I had to like just throw it all away and focus on like three or four pieces, work on that. And then just constantly apply, do our tests, keep grinding, just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I don't know what did it, but I got flown to, my job was at Sony online. And so I got flown out here to Bellevue and talking to the art director, he like, he really liked what I did. He liked the potential. He liked my attitude and everything, but he even straight up told me, he's like, Hey, I just don't know how I can justify hiring a junior versus hiring a lead at the moment. Cause they had nobody yet. Like, like I mentioned, oh, yeah. and I, I told him, I'm like, I'm just looking for an opportunity. That's it. Like, you're not going to regret it if you're, if you uh, give me this chance and stuff. And I think that's whatever I said, whatever I did worked, they offered me something um, and I was able to uh, move up here. And that I think has just been like the waterfall effect of like, ever since that, I've just been able to like keep pushing through and stuff. And, yeah. And then after that, it's like, you get to know people and it's all networking and it's all connections and stuff. I don't, I don't think I've actually, even even Facebook, I don't think I actually gotten into a job without like some sort of connection. Oh, yeah. So funny. Now knowing people who like work in corporate and like just making the connections as soon as one person goes from one place to another place, they like bring three people with them. And then the, <laughs> and then there's like this web that's created of people who know people and like they just bounce around from each other's jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now you've you've been doing this for quite a while. You have quite a number of companies under your belt in many years it looks like like good like solid chunks of time like four years five years what have been some of your favorite moments or projects that you've worked on uh I think like most recently I'm really proud of uh the work that we did over at on dead labs um on state of the k2 mm -hmm. and specifically well, the, the vanilla game for state of the k2 because that project was hard to get out um but then the subsequent DLC Heartland, uh, which I was heavily involved in. That one, it was also something that I'm really, it was just, I'm proud of. And it was like super fun to do because it was a really restricted timeline. It was a game mode that was not thought feasible by many in leadership to be able to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, and between me and the lead designer that was uh, in charge of it as well, like we all, we just like pulled it off in record time. Like I think something like six months or less. Wow. Uh, we were able to pull that off. So I'm really proud of that one. And then there was um, one of the other ones I remember. I, I love every project I've been at. Um, yeah. There's ups and downs. So I, I have a lot of really fond memories from them. But one of the other ones that I really enjoyed and I kind of regret a little is um, we were working on, when I was at Fifth Cell, we were working on a Scribble Knots game, a, a 3D Scribble Knots game. And that was super fun. I don't know if you're familiar with Scribble Knots, but. A little bit. Uh, but Okay, so if you know the premise, it's like you can write anything and it comes to life. So, but not only does it just spawn, it has the properties of what that object is. So if it's a zombie, it behaves like a zombie. It's attracted to, you know, other characters, wants to eat them. But you can also add adjectives like changing the color, changing the pattern, also changing behaviors on them. And that was all in 2D done uh, for the most part, all the projects. And we were turning that into 3D. So there's like a huge added layer to all of it. And the, the art style being super whimsical and stuff was just super interesting. You're seeing that a lot nowadays with like Ranchet and Clank and some of the, that art style is now a little bit more broad. But at the time, like everybody was just doing bald man with gun in the cover. Like that was all they were doing. So yeah, unfortunately that didn't go anywhere. We only got uh, to kind of like 
pitch it kind of face. Yeah. Uh, very early tech for it, but uh, that's one that I think till this day, anybody that was involved with it, we we still talk. We're like, come on, just put our money together <laughs> and that should have happened and build that game because that game was had a lot of cool stuff going for it. Yeah, that sounds pretty unique and complicated. <laughs> very, very complicated. <laughs> and now you're working at Facebook. Yes, so... meta, meta, I guess. Yes. Yeah, Meta. Okay, which is so funny because I just got. Uh, an Oculus, so like for the first time, it was gifted as a Christmas gift, and then I never experienced any sort of VR, and then like it just blew me away. I was like, "What the heck?" <laughs> <laughs> so you're three three D artist. Are you allowed to talk about any of the stuff that you're doing? Not specifics, but I mean, I'm working on the Horizon. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. The the creating worlds and stuff like that for Horizon. That I think that's about as much as I can say. Oh, okay, so like the process of creating art for virtual reality, what programs do you use and then how does that conversion from like being on you make stuff on the computer right and then you put it into the metaverse so it's, well because I'm, I'm working specifically in horizon it's it, they have their own tool so you're building everything in there so you're wow. in the head that you're 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 working with the tools that the the project yeah. provides so everybody the, the tools that every are available to you right now if you go and launch it that's what i'm working with oh um, but okay. that's because that's the way that that uh, project okay. is being built. Like if you're talking traditional 3D, it's really no different. Mm. Um, the main difference is that the cost of rendering is higher because you have two cameras now rendering the same object versus one in just a 2D plane. So that's why you have to like try to get uh, high frame rate so that people don't get sick, don't get motion sick and stuff like that. So like the, the performance restraints are the restrictions are really much, much higher, which is why you're seeing so much uh, kind of what you would call lower fidelity art in, in VR at the moment, yeah. mm-hmm. um, or at least what you would compare to like a, between a PS2 and a, a 360 mm-hmm. era kind of art, art wise and stuff. There are some other games like I think Lone Echo and, and those are just, they look way beyond that for sure. But in general, that's a kind of like really blocky um, or very kind of like a uh, cutesy style stuff that you see it's because of because of that but the tools themselves for creating the 3d are no different it's just that things that don't pop or read as much in a 2d screen they just pop way more and you you've experienced it now when you've been in there like things that with like depth are way more prominent in vr and they, they they're just so much more immersive there than they are in a 2d screen so you end up trying to create shapes and things that catch light can you know catch a, a little bit of ambient inclusion create more parallax and things like that like a simple cube looks so much better in vr than it does in it just like maya or max or something and like you don't have to do anything to it just that sense of presence and feeling that the volume is kind of there is what really does it so outside of that there's not that much difference you can still use all the same tools and stuff you can use unity you can use your own homemade engine um unreal and you can still use all the the normal tools you would it's just that you have to be aware of other things so how do you like working in vr versus working outside of vr it's different it's it's very different um you get the vr hair for example like you put the headset on and you're in there so you come out and you, you get, like, line. Oh. yeah so like i don't even bother like combing my hair anymore during the day <laughs> unless i'm gonna have a meeting or something like yeah it's not worth it but um it's cool. Like I worked in VR initially when it was launching, when the the Oculus was coming out, and we did. Uh, we worked on an RTS game when I was at the at Hidden Path, and we worked on porting over uh, Defense Grid, Defense Grid Two. We ported that over, for, which was PC into VR, and mm-hmm. the process there was very similar to making a normal game. Like you were working on it on Maya stuff, and then you like get it in the engine, put the headset on, go test it out, and stuff like that. What I'm doing now is much, much more different because I'm in there building it in 3D and stuff. So okay, so you actually have the headset on the whole time, like you're working inside of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's something um, that's different com- uh, compared to like five, six years ago when I first touched uh, VR. So it's, it, it is different. I do enjoy sometimes uh, being in there. You lose time. Like that's something that's new to me. Um, what feels like 20 minutes it's like two hours suddenly you're like, oh, I'm, I skipped this meeting entirely. I, I don't know. So time flies by a lot when you're in there um, compared to when you're just working in a more traditional 
uh, setting with like Maya and things like that. But I also enjoy that quite a bit, um, especially for doing levels and things like that. I, I, I mean, that's that's my bread and butter. That's what I, I'm, I'm, I've done for so many years. Yeah, 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 that's cool. Do you get nauseous at all or motion sickness from? I do actually, I don't, I didn't used to get nauseous. Um, at least I don't remember getting nauseous uh, back when I, when it first came out and I was at Hidden Path, but that was also because I wasn't on it for, you know, six hours a day. Um, but, but being in there now, like I definitely have to take breaks and I'll work for two hours and stuff. And I'll try to like, just step away for 15 minutes because like my eyes get strained or, you know, so sometimes like I'll turn off collision on something by accident and I'll fall through and I get that vertigo. So, oh, um, my gosh, yeah, yeah. I haven't touched the headset in years since I was at a hidden path until I, uh, recently started at meta. And, um, I definitely had to get a little bit of like sea legs back yeah uh, some adjusting. Uh, yeah but they've added so much more comfort options and things and the the new headset is so much more comfortable than the original one and everything so it's not that bad I'm just yeah. having to get used to it and kind of build up that tolerance yeah I'm a, I'm a person who gets motion sickness pretty badly um so I can be on there for like maybe 30 minutes but then I start to get like ooh, <laughs> and I have to take it off yeah. um but I'm sure like as Facebook or Meta keeps working on it, like I'm sure it'll get better and better in the, I don't know exactly what it is physiologically that makes the motion sickness happen, but I'm sure they'll find ways to improve it. Yeah, I'm sure that's mul multiple things. One of the things I remember learning uh, early on was uh, it's, it's your lizard brain that's telling you, that's why you get, that's why you get sick. Like especially with motion, you're moving in there, but your body's not moving. And it's a way of your mind telling you that you're poisoned. And so you start getting motion sick because you're trying to throw that up and stuff like that. So it's a very like primitive thing. That's, mm. that's one of the things I do remember uh, learning when I was starting to work in this space. I am sure that there's way more research and way more explanations around many other factors. Yeah. Uh, that is one that is like probably one of the most common ones is you being moved in the, in the world and yeah. you're not moving physically, like your brain thinks like you're dizzy brain. or something. Your brain starts to tell you like, you need to throw them up because you have poison in here. Who, oh, that's funny. Who are some of your favorite artists throughout your career? Like artists that you look up to, artists that make work that inspire you? So I don't have artists per se. I, I think I can call out like Loish, uh, if you know. Oh yeah, her. yeah. I really love all her drawings like they they like they're, they're in my wallpaper I have all her sketchbooks I have like I even have like these little like uh these little like bookmarks and stuff that I get uh, <laughs> of her yeah. art so she's probably one of the few ones that I can actually kind of name off the top of my head um yeah but there's also I just like art and after a while I learned that I like oh all these ones are from the same artist kind of thing there's mm -hmm. the the visual developer artist for Disney uh, I forget her name but she, she did the visual development for Frozen. Um, she was also, I think, involved with Encanto recently. Oh. So, so like, you, you, I can recognize her art now and you can just kind of see it. And I, I really love that. But I'm honestly more inspired by people that I've worked with. So I have a, yeah. my, my friend, yeah. uh, Kentaya. He's, he actually made this, this hat. He makes all these hats or used to. I don't know if he makes them anymore. But <laughs> cool. he's somebody that like, just like, I love the little cutesy art style stuff that he has going on and then his uh, attitude and his work ethics and stuff like that. Like they had a, had a really huge impact on me uh, as well. So I have like, I think the people that I look up to, Mike Ozeal as well as another artist that like I really look up to, I worked with him as well. So I think I tend to be more inspired by the folks that I'm directly involved with, but I love to browse art stations sometimes and just look at, yeah. I don't necessarily can tell you like I've attached to this one <laughs> artist. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. I consume a lot of art, but you know, I, there's only like a few people that I would be able to look at their art and be like, Oh, that's Aaron blaze. Yeah. I mean, I like all the, a lot of the classical paintings and stuff. And if I had like, if I had named one artist, probably it'd be Van Gogh, the one that I would say like, Oh, I really like enjoy because just the attitude of like, fuck it. I'm going to draw the way I want to. Did you go to the, um, Van Gogh VR? No, thing? I, 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 it's, I don't even know. It's still going on. Oh, I don't know. It was going on for like a month or more. It was. I, I wanted to, but like I have uh, diabetes type two, type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. 
my wife has a little bit of asthma problems and then we have our one year old uh well <laughs> who's gonna turn one year old so we've been a little bit cautious right now with the pandemic like not exposing yeah. ourselves because we're all kind of like in the higher end of the risk higher risk yeah yeah right. so so we didn't go there but we wanted to um uh, and I know Van Gogh also is like what my wife's favorite so that's oh one. yeah it, it just yeah. so happens that we both liked it I know she likes him way more than I do but that's mm-hmm. one of the ones that I could point to. And Monet, I love Monet because oh, it, blows, Monet's it blows me away how like his paintings, just how good they are and how like limited the palette are and how muted they are and yet how much expression and life there there is in them. So yeah, and I've equally been impacted by not just artists, but like designers. I think like that the designers that I've worked with have like just challenged the way I think about things, like made me really like stick to make, have made me stick to my guns and then proven me wrong. So I love them because of that. Like they just like have educated me and broken me in ways that like, I don't, I've never been the same since. That's awesome. (laughs) What are some challenges that you have faced throughout your career as an artist designer? What have been the hardest things? That right there, I think like you have mentioning both titles. I think that's been a struggle. (laughs) Um, That has been something that like, until we very recently, even I wasn't, 100% 100% sure of um, because like especially here in the U.S. that what I find is that people like to put you in a box and give you a label and it's like this is what you are you're a character artist or you're a creature artist you're a weapon artist you're you know you're a systems designer you're so you get put into this box and it's like you only specialize in these one set of skills or these one set of processes um, the culture that I come from and many other people around the world, it's like you try to do as much as you can before you, and it's not before you ask for help. And, and when I say that, it's not like you don't want to ask for help, but like, you don't, you're just trying to add as much value first. Yeah. You want to be, you know, or you rely on other folks and yeah. And the culture that I've encountered a lot, is like, well, that's, I don't do that. So that has to be somebody else. <laughs> uh, and I've experienced this a lot now that I'm a, a homeowner, like, getting contractors here is like, I bring the trim, but I don't actually like drill it in. That's another person. Uh, and it's like, wait, what? Like, so things take a lot longer and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> and I have found, I found a, I have found a similar mentality in, in the industry, um, which has mm-hmm. impeded me from growing at the pace that I wish I had been growing. Yeah, um, I can see it, that. To the point where I, I started taking like some of the certificates that you talk about, right? I like, I took some of them just to see, like, I'm like, what am I missing that I don't yeah. know? Um, and I took, like, recently a level design one, like, two years ago, I think is when I took it. Mm-hmm. I think it's two years ago. Because I've been doing level design for, you know, a better part of, like, seven years of my career. And every single time that I try to, like, break into that officially, it, I, there was gates. There were things that people just didn't understand. And maybe I also didn't know exactly how to communicate it. So I'm like, okay, well... I'm going to go t- take this course and see what I um, am missing, what I need to learn. It was great because I didn't learn anything. I, I, like I had already, I knew all the steps. I knew all the stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm already doing it. It's just that because I'm coming from the art side of things mostly, um, or traditionally like the bulk of my career, people can't stop labeling me as just an artist. Um, uh, yeah. And that was like a, a huge breakthrough um, where I was like, felt a lot more confident in asking for exactly what I needed and stuff. Uh, how I wanted to do my work, how I want to be able to like just develop as a as an artist, as a designer and stuff like that, like this mix of both brains. And that I think I've started to meet people that get it. Um, there was a, a huge stride when I was uh, at Undead Labs, like getting that going. It was really hard to get that actually like acknowledged. Um, it finally did get acknowledged. And then we were able to like make strides and stuff like that. But now I'm in a, I'm in another phase of my career now. So yeah yeah it sounds like you really have to advocate for you know like the kind of work that you want to be doing and like how you want to do your work well advocating for artists as well like um i i this is one of the arguments that i have with programmers for example a lot of the times or some some more not just programmers but technical people as we all know programmers get paid probably the highest uh out of anybody in in a in a game studio and the questions and the arguments that we've had around some of those topics have been, you solve problems in a very like logical and kind of like scientific manner, right? You're thinking about steps and things like that. 
artists are solving things from a very visual and creative standpoint. You, an artist would not be able to go in and code what you're doing. You wouldn't be able to go in and art what they're doing or solve it visually. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, so what's the difference in the problem solving equation, right? Like that's, you're doing the same equation. You're just like doing it differently. Yeah, so you're just coming why would you, a different. Why would you value one more over the other? And so I, I do think like, uh, programmers themselves are valuable because of the certain skill set that you other people don't have but also artists are in the same way and that's one thing that I my entire career I've been trying to advocate is like to not make artists lesser than in the equation like of a of a game studio or like a creative team or anything like that and then how is your work-life balance in this industry it was really bad, I think, in the first half of my career, I, I, I think. Um, and ne- now it's a lot better. Like, I don't, I don't think I've crunched hard at all for the last, like, six years, seven years or something like that. When I worked out on Dead Labs, we crunched a couple times. There was programmers did have to crunch quite a bit there when we shipped uh, State of the K2. I crunched uh, a couple nights and things like that, crunched a little bit over the last two years, but it's like... A couple nights after that in a lot of studios now and i've been fortunate enough to be in some of them have learned to kind of like know how to give you the freedom to know when you should put your time in and to also let you know like hey you're working too much yeah. um so i appreciated that quite a bit that i was able to go in and say i'm gonna work 10 hours today because a i can i have the freedom to do that uh, in my personal life and also i can take time off later on. Like I, I can shave that time back a little bit. Yeah. Um, that's not a practice you want to do. You kind of want to like just have a regular schedule for the most part, but it wasn't like, Hey, you're crunching. And now you're back to just a normal schedule. I could like take the next day off or something yeah. like that. So I get to Great. make a choice myself about where I need to put the time in. Um, but I, if I work like a nine hour day or 10 hour day nowadays, it's super, super rare. Whereas when I started the first three months of my career, I think I was working like 16 hour days. So, uh, yeah, I've heard uh, from a lot of people that are in the industry that they're still like trying to figure out their work-life balance. And I feel like the longer you're in it, the more you kind of figure out, um, figure out your boundaries and the more you're able to advocate for your own. You know? Yeah. I think the industry in general is getting better, but I think it's a really hard problem to solve because it's, it's not like, other jobs or, or under industries where you can have almost like a formula. There, there's a part where you can kind of like make it a formula and have like a little bit of like a, just a process going. Mm-hmm. But before that, it's, it's a creative industry. So how do you formalize? I don't even know that's a word. How do you like make a formula out of creativity itself? You can make habits and you can make patterns of like, I work, get up at seven, I work. So you just work through it but at the same time like at the end of the day especially in games if it's not fun it's not fun so you have to kind of try to go back and figure out what else can you do what can you redo um and that's hopefully producers and leadership is making content for the game that's modular enough that they can like rearrange the content without having to recreate it um that's a smart way of doing it but there's also the factor of like there's not a formula for I want to make an RTS game. So I need to do this, 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 and this, and it's going to be fun. It's like, even if you do all that and you model something after Starcraft or something like that, that you know is successful, doesn't mean you're going to be successful, right? You have to find that like it factor. And that just yeah. takes time to do. Mm-hmm. You never know exactly how it's going to go. So from all of your experience in the industry now, if you were going to give somebody advice, what would you tell them? I think I would say to not rely or not put as much emphasis on polishing the skills that comes with time and that just comes with experience, but like make sure that you're, you know, that you're a good teammate, that your uh, willingness to work with others and your ability to like help elevate others is, is something that you're okay with doing um, and that you're, you're, you're interested in it because compared to like a solo artist career, you're working with a lot of folks. So you need to be able to, work with them, uh, know when to like, let somebody else take charge and, or take credit, you know, like do what they want to do, even if it's not something you want to do that skill set and that, like those soft skills are way more valuable than somebody that is like an insanely good artist, um, or an insanely good programmer or something like that. Like people will tend to, uh, go with the person that's maybe not as skilled, 
but is like way has, easier like, to like work great, with. Great personality. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I mean, you have to have something to back it up. I want to say like definitely put, yeah. the <laughs> put the time in and make sure that you're developing those skills, but laser focusing on your skills have to be the best thing. Your portfolio has to be the best thing and stuff like that is not where all the effort should go. Yeah. To be a little bit of a balance of hard and soft skills. Yeah. You might have to do it more on the hard skills at first, just to be able to get in. Mm-hmm. But afterwards, it's like, you don't need to keep focusing on, on that. Um, I see it's like so many people like posting on Instagram and stuff where they're like nonstop working every single day, or they're like spinning up new things that they publish. And I'm like, I can't do that. I've never been able to do that with like the life balance thing and everything. So yeah. don't judge yourself against those things. Like you, you're doing okay. Just keep going. Yeah. Compare yourself to yourself, not, you know, the other people who are. Going it's good to be inspired, but, but if you start comparing yourself to the art station portfolios and to everything oh. else, it's like, it's, it's really rough. Like you don't know what those folks are working. Like maybe they're hardly sleeping. Maybe they don't see their families. Maybe, yeah. so, you know, like they're not in the same situation that you are in. Yeah. There's, there's definitely a lot of people who are sacrificing a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. It comes with a sacrifice. Right. And that's something that none of us really see because that's not posted. Yep. It's only all the amazing uh, outcomes and products and, you know, artwork that's coming out. <laughs> I think one of the other ones that I would also say, cause this, this was a really hard lesson for me to, to finally grasp is that your success is not based off of the titles and the projects that you have shipped. Um, I think for the longest time, because as you've seen in my resume, like I've only been at a handful of studios for like a very long periods of time each. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one more canceled games than I have uh, shipped ones. And I see for uh, friends and new f- people that I like are in the industry now, their second or first job, they got a Ghost of Tsushima out or something like that, right? It's, it's a little bit of luck and getting in there, but that's not a reflection on your skill set, on your trajectory and stuff like that. So don't, even though the industry tends to judge you based on what you've shipped, it's not all there. And you'll, you'll learn that a little bit after a certain amount of years. But if, yeah. if somebody can hear those words and just keep them close by because they'll help when you're feeling down about why haven't I been successful Mm, it's also out of your hands it's not (laughs) it's not canceled because you weren't good so what are your goals for the future do you do you have any big or career goals left or small career goals or personal goals uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm entering a new phase in my life with, uh, my first son and him growing up and stuff. So yeah. I think like we're, we're trying to evaluate, like, what do we want to do in the next several years? But right now I'm just joined Meta. I have like some things that I want to do there. Um, some, some experiences that I want to have and, and try to like put some skill sets to the test there. So outside of that, it's like, just take it as, as it comes kind of thing. Like I've always like, just looked at the next challenge and, how is it that my skill set or my interest can best apply for it? So, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, do you plan on staying in Bellevue for indefinite future? I don't know. I, I mean, I've been here for so long now. Like, if you, I think if you would have asked me that like even 10 years ago, I would have said no. But like, <laughs> this is 10, 10 years <laughs> later and I'm still here. Um, I definitely want to like go somewhere else, um, even if, if it's for a little bit. But yeah. we don't know. Like, I'm, I've been really eyeing moving to Europe for some time. So Ooh, that's yeah. something that like, I think if, if the timing and the opportunity were to show up, like I could definitely consider that. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. No, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this was awesome. Very constructive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's different talking about some 3D uh, and games and stuff like that than pure art. I, I can, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's quite some difference. I, I learned some things. <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed and learned something again. That was Luis Yepes. If you want to go check out his art station or his LinkedIn, I have linked both of them in the description. And if you enjoyed this episode and you want to see this channel grow so I can continue to bring you artists that you want to hear from, I would appreciate it if you would hit the subscribe button, give the video a like, and comment what you thought about this episode. To be notified when the next episode goes live, go ahead and hit the notification bell or follow me on my Instagram at Erin Christine Ross, where I also do artist features every single weekday. So if you'd like to be considered for a feature or you have somebody in mind to be featured, you can go ahead and head over to my Instagram and send me a message. Thank you so much for watching.